Thank you very much, Alexei. I'm going to kick off. My name is Lawrence. Uh, I work at Cloudflare, and then Timor is going to also present the big chunk of this uh, presentation. Um, and we titled it uh, Defragmenting the Loader Landscape. Um, we had a hard time coming up with a good name that kind of encompasses everything we want to talk about. So this is really about Timo's part, which I think is very interesting and exciting. What is on the agenda? Um, part one is going to be a bit of marketing about Cilium eBPF and what it's used for, what it is in the first place. Part two, um, I am going to tell you about an idea that I have to make generating new API bindings for other languages easier. And then finally, um, Timo is going to talk about uh, his idea to make um, offloaders more integrated and to be uh, a better citizen, even better citizen in the community, I should say. So let's get started. Uh, first off, what is Cilium eBVF? What is it? What can you do? Uh, some of you might have been at uh, previous plumbers, of course, and we talked about this there, but it's uh, worth reiterating. So Cilium eBPF is a eBPF library in pure Go. It's maintained by us, Cloudflare, and Cilium. It's really easy to distribute. There's no dependency on the C compiler. It's easy to cross compile. And I would say that we focus on what I, would, I think is a good name for this is like fat user space. Uh, EPPF programs, so things that get loaded into the kernel where there's lots of logic in user space that needs to happen. And finally, it's MIT licensed. This is to preempt uh, questions that invariable tend to come up. Why do we do this in the first place? Uh, and I think there's like loads of nuance to this topic as we saw yesterday in the talk from the IR uh, Rust people. Um, I think one of the strongest arguments is that Go has a fat runtime, and this means that function, the foreign function interface, which is called CGO, is significantly slower than syscalls. Uh, it's hard to distribute, makes binaries bigger, and it's just not a good experience to work with it. A couple of use cases that Timo has collected from um, people that have contributed to the, to the library, and then we've reached out and try to figure out what they're using it for. First off is run CN container D. Some people will know this. Uh, it's used by Docker and Kubernetes to execute uh, containers. And they use uh, secret uh, device filters. Next up is what's called Datadog agent. And they provide um, observability for workloads that run on machines. We have Intel with a thing that's called the CRI Resource Manager, which is a really cool idea, I think. Um, they use BPF to track how much AVX 520 instructions, um, I think, a workload uh, executes. And then depending on how noisy it is, it will move those workload away from other workloads. We have Palant here uh, that kind of do a more classical tracing style um, use case. And they have a, a cool talk that you should watch, which kind of goes into the details why they do it and how. There's also Hetzner Cloud. Uh, they do some contract limitation uh, using K-probes. Um, there is Microsoft with a tool that is called Inspector Gadget. It seems to be like a, a Swiss knife for Kubernetes applications, as far as I understand it. Finally, not finally, sorry. Second to last, there's Cloudflare. And we have a lot of uh, stuff kind of written in XDP for DDoS mitigation. We have a layer for load balancer, control planes of various kinds, and we use the library extensively. There's also some open source code that you can look at if you'd like to. Now, finally, we have Cilium. Um, and Cilium is a container network interface implementation for Kubernetes uh, that has some really advanced features that uh, are very heavy users of uh, BPF and all of the tooling that it provides. Now, in my work on the library, we kind of so far have generated bindings for BPF syscalls by hand. So whenever a new feature was required, I would go and or the contributor would go and look at the source code of the kernel and take the struct and manually um, convert that. It was kind of tedious, it's error prone, 
And instead, um, there would be a nice idea to just take the VM Linux BTF and write out code types and functions. At the bottom, you can see what that would kind of looks like. So there's a function to make the syscall and some attributes that are embedded in the struct. And there are, of course, challenges to this. Um, the code type system doesn't know unions, uh, which we have to deal with. And the runtime also has a garbage collector. What does this mean? Um, we need to make sure that we tag every single pointer in the types that we generate correctly. Otherwise, the garbage collector can go and free things behind our back, and then uh, our applications will crash. There's also no explicit control over whether an object is allocated on the heap or the stack. I want to go through some examples of things that I found difficult while uh, generating the types or the bindings, I should say. On the left-hand side is what is currently in bpf.h, and that should be familiar to uh, lots of you here. Uh, there's an enum that defines a couple of flags, and then we have the big uh, union bpf adder, which is passed to the bpf syscall. The problem with this is that the, there's no way to easily refer to the enum or this struct that's embedded in the union from BTF because I don't have a name. And I think the, the kind of, if, if I were to say, oh, how could we fix this? The, the obvious solution is to just add a name. So we give the enum a name and we kind of add a new struct that has this uh, map create name, for example. I'll keep using the same layout where on the left is what's in BPF.h right now and on the right is a suggestion what we could change to um, improve the situation. Next up is preprocessor macros. Uh, I think on Monday there was a talk about this already where um, it's clear that they aren't present in the BTF, so there's no way for us to ever generate from them. I think a pragmatic approach is to switch over the remaining flags to enums. There's also the issue of invisible pointers that kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier with uh, the Go having a garbage collector. You can see on the left there's this structure which in it has a path name field and the type of that is aligned U64. This is just a way for the BPF user space API to say this is a pointer that is always 64 bits. It doesn't matter whether this is running on a 32-bit architecture or 64-bit one. The problem with aligned U64 is that it doesn't really end up in the BTF. It's just It just looks like a UN64. So we can't automatically tell where these important pointers are. And because remember, we need to kind of tag each pointer, uh, otherwise the garbage collector will go and do nasty things. On the right-hand side, you can see what we could replace it with. Uh, there's already this uh, cool macro, BPF MD pointer. I think that means metadata. And on the bottom, you can see that this just equivalent to a union where there's this pointer type and then make sure that this field has the right size and right alignment. Finally, um, my favorite part, I think uh, this is what I call field overloading, and there's a struct and it has a comment that says used by BPF star get star ID. And whenever I read it, I kind of in my head, I have to go and do like a mental pattern matching. Um, I've done the work for you. So on the right hand side, you can see what, what actually the different commands take. Um, I, mean, I want to draw your attention to one thing, um, which is I think the most interesting which is that this map get FD by ID actually has a field next ID, which is completely ignored by the syscall. And to me, that was not at all clear from, from looking at the type definition in BPF.h. I had to kind of go and look at the implementation. And I think my argument here is that this structure on the left that we have is hard to understand both for machines, because we can't generate the correct types, but actually it's also hard to understand for humans. And that's something more like it was on the right-hand side where kind of for individual commands, we have individual um, structs uh, would be easier. A quick recap, 
And that's also going to be the end of my talk. Um, I think we can simplify BPFH for robots and we, in the same instance, also make it easier to use for humans. And we can use enums instead of macros. We could give types and fields a name. We could use the BPF metadata pointer macro. And we could also have one field in BPF editor for each BPF command. And I haven't tried all of these yet, but I think that um, they can be made backwards compatible, of course. Um, that's it from my side. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now. And then afterwards, Timo is going to take over from me and talk about the loader landscape. Well, since we're in the middle of the talk, I will just give my few cents, quick few cents here. I think <clears throat> totally makes sense. And all of the issues you pointed out with BPF that age, uh, well, real and worse uh, fixing. Cool. And Paul is saying all of the changes to BPF that age would also make it easier to detect necessary updates for S trace, S quarter, etc. Yes, I agree as well. Cool. So I have my work cut out. I think Paul has a question. Oh yeah, there we go. That's what you just read. Thank you. Okay, I think my next step would be that um, probably sometime next week I might start sending things with easier bits like adding naming enums, stuff like that, and then see how far I get and ask people to give feedback. So thank you very much. I think Florian was still typing a question, but I'm not sure if it'll come through. Um, if it's OK, then I can get started. So my name is Timo. I work at Isovalent on Cilium, and I also co-maintain the Go library presented here in this talk. Um, and Today, I will talk about integrating alpha loaders or how we can align second parties, so to speak, better with LibBPF. Um, full disclosure, this is actually Martina's idea. Um, I was looking for a way to present something like this or actually present a solution to this for a while now, and then uh, he floated the idea a few weeks back, so well, here it is. Um, first, let's sketch out the loader landscape, how it is today. So we have LibBPF. I'm sorry, when we say loaders, we say uh, uh, solutions or projects that actually implement their own ELF loading natively, like non-wrapper non projects. There's a bunch of these in, in other languages as well. Um, but just for the sake of the argument here, let's limit ourselves to this list. Um, there's obviously the BPF, Cilium EVPF, and then IRS as well that was pre presented yesterday. But Last but not least, also eBPF for Windows, which cannot look at GPL code as far as I understand. So they might also benefit from um, the solution that's going to be presented here. Um, of course, features still land on eBPF first because it's the upstream solution, like it's the blessed implementation, of course. Um, but there's no real straightforward way for other projects to verify whether or not they're compliant with how LibBPF does things. So, of course, the question is, how could we align these projects better? Um, a few years ago at LPC 2019, it was mentioned often, like from crowd interactions and also in the talk itself, that LibBPF is considered to be the spec. And that's all fine and well, but how do we actually codify this without having to go look at the source code? Well, we might have to end up doing that anyway, but without really reading and understanding the source code of LibBPF and like cheating to see exactly how they're doing things. Um, how could we codify this as a bit more of a contract instead of a convention? Um, so maybe instead of a vague spec, let's, let's write some tests. A um, bit of background first. Uh, the compiler communicates with the loader through ELF binaries. And existing loaders like LibBPF, BPF tool, and Historically, also IP Route 2, but they now also since migrated to the BPF a few months back. Um, they expect ELF, so EBPF, ELF binaries to follow certain conventions. A very basic example of this is ELF section names. So 
Legacy map definitions always went into the map section. VTF maps now go into dot maps. And for example, the program attached type is attached as a string, sorry, prepended as a string to the section name. Um, of course, as time went on, the eBPF feature set and also the ELF contents and, and the, just the complexity of the BPF subsystem grew more complex. And the loader had to follow suit, obviously, to cater to this. Um, so now, how do we verify that ELFs get correctly parsed and that none of its contents get ignored? For example, when a new ELF section is introduced by, let's say, BTF, not so recently anymore, it's been a few years now. Um, so how do we, how, how does a BPF program that's been loaded into the kernel tell that all of the sections were taken into, into account? And how do we ensure the loader stays compatible with older and newer kernels, older and newer LVM versions, also frequently uh, causes some regressions? Um, how do we verify compliance with the BPF itself, since it's considered the spec? Um, and then also, which is, I feel a bit of a, a recurring theme here at LPC, how can Linux maintain control over the tool chain and, and keep everything compatible, compliant, uh, and a bit uniform in the, you know, the ELF format, for example, or just the way that eBPF works? Um, obviously, eBPF programs that only work with lower X or Y are not ideal. Nobody wants this, especially not us. Like we, we just want everything to, to work regardless of which user space language or runtime you're using. And it's also a bit considered that more loaders equals more ecosystem fragmentation, but maybe this is not fully the case. Um, so today the Linux kernel ships with a set of self-tests and they verify if they basically verify all the um, all the components in the tool chain, the compiler, the loader, the kernel, and they, they test a wide variety of behaviors end to end. And building them results in user space programs as well as BPF objects, as we see here. XD ping uh, is the user space executable that actually gets run by the test suite. This executable will pick up the object XDP uh, XD ping underscore kern, and it will load it, parse it. Um, and then do all the execute all the actions that is uh, expected to actually get maps created, load the program into the kernel, perform relocations, etc. Um, there are a few problems with this that we found working with this from Go. Um, besides the BPF programs themselves, as I mentioned, the self sets also require a specific user space code to load and exercise them. They're all specific to the particular BPF program, so there's no one, there isn't one program that can load all um, BPF ELFs, let's say, and execute them in a uniform fashion. That's that's just not the case. They're, they're all separate. They're all discrete test programs. They're quite often complex. They set up arbitrary net devices, addresses, send packets back and forth, et cetera, just to, to test kernel and loader behavior end to end. And there's simply too many to replicate in other languages, uh, especially when working on smaller teams. If it's just a few few people uh, working on a loader project, then there's just there, there are no development cycles to implement all of these, make sure they're kept up to date, bug free, etc. And so there's no way to verify if the loader's resulting bytecode is correct, even when it's accepted by the verifier. Some core offset might be wrong, like it might be within bounds, but it might not read at the right offset. It might be off by one, by four, by eight, who knows. Um, and as I mentioned slightly before, unfortunately, the self-tests also exist to exercise behavior of the kernel itself specifically, not just the loader. And if you're writing a loader project, you only really care about is my project is the software that I'm writing, is it doing the right thing? Uh, the second problem that we're running into when, um, maybe I haven't mentioned this, but the, the Solim eBPF project builds all the self-tests that are, that are sitting in the kernel tree and we load them, but we don't execute them. And we're running into the problem where self-tests are added 
to the kernel tree, but they're meant to be invalid, like they're intentionally invalid. Um, they serve to test the negative behavior, like you, you write some invalid instruction, then the loader is supposed to error out or the verifier will return an error. Um, and the issue that we're having is that they're not really named consistently to reflect this fact. So we basically have to resort to uh, ignoring them or ignoring errors on specific uh, tests. In this case, um, I've, I've included a small snippet here. Um, so for example, these two uh, core tests, we ignore errors when we load them into the kernel because they're just built to fail. Um, so in our opinion, another approach is needed. Um, as I mentioned before, the self-test elves are parsed and loaded, but never executed. So there might be subtle bugs that we currently simply cannot uncover. Um, so we would like to propose unit tests that target the user space loader infra in isolation. So without, um, without relying too much on kernel behavior being there, um, but I'll, I'll outline this in the next few slides. So since all loaders, let's say, that exist today, Rust, Go, uh, and libbpf as well, um, the common factor between all of them is, of course, BPF. So could we possibly craft BPF programs that test themselves at runtime? Um, the answer is yes, we can. Uh, we have a few examples of this. Uh, so as a few basic principles, we should try to build eBPF programs that contain useful line info BTF so that the verifier output is clear. Like, hey, you're, um, I'm, I'm receiving bytecode here that doesn't make any sense. And then the, the inline, sorry, the line info would explain a bit why, maybe using macros or comments. Um, they can contain runtime assertions. So reading particular map values and comparing them using immediate comparisons. Um, for example, also making sure if the right map access has been relocated into an instruction. And then, as I mentioned before, also checking if core relocations have been executed by reading some known good values, like some uh, a, a struct somewhere that contains bytes one, two, three, four, and then making sure at runtime that we're reading the same values in. Um, this could generate error feedback by reading the verifier log or BPF prog run. Uh, or a combination of both. Another requirement for this would be, of course, a minimal user space surface. So a program, uh, basically a, a loader program or a testing program that's devoid of any business logic and only interacts with the most simple, the BPF APIs. This would make it easier to port to other platforms or languages. And for example, it could just find else on disk using a glob of some sort, um, invoking the loader that loads programs, maps, BTF, performs necessary transformations, just does everything in the background. This should not be part of the test suite itself. That's all the loader's job. Um, then, for example, it could load a program. Uh, if it doesn't pass the verifier, it could display what the verifier log is. Uh, and then if the load does fail, it could call prog run on all programs in the ELF, and it would succeed if the test returns zero. So what would this actually look like? There's a few examples that we have in the, in the Go project, so in Silm EBPF. Um, for example, on the left for static data relocation, based on different qualifiers of this variable, so unique is a volatile const, and in C code, we assign it the value minus one. And depending on the qualifier of the variable, this will, this will end up in a different ELF section, but still, Later, we execute a program that makes sure that using an immediate comparison like uneg needs to be equal to minus one, neg needs to be equal to minus two. If it doesn't, it will sort of generate a runtime assertion, so the, the return value of the program will not be zero. Same for core relocations. Um, we expect these types to be core relocated into the BPF program. If it's not the case, then it would just generate a runtime assertion and the test would fail. Sorry, runtime exception. So um, what would be the next step? So we suggest an independent loader test suite that is separate from other end-to-end -end kernel or eBPF self-tests. So 
for example, we could submit a new test loader test suite to the Linux tree just to have all the test code centralized there. And other projects like Sony VPF or Aya could build these self tests in CI or pre build them uh, like we do now. And then um, basically just run the loader against them and see what happens. If everything passes, then that means the loader is doing a good job. Um, this would also allow us to iteratively agree on a common set of behaviors that all loaders must implement. Maybe from day one, we could just have basic features, how to load an elf, perform basic relocations, uh, relocate maps into programs, etc. And then over time, we could expand this to basically absorb more and more functionality. Um, a reverse example of how this could actually benefit the Linux um, project upstream uh, is a feature that we landed recently in the in Cilium eBPF. Um, so Cilium makes heavy use of tail call maps. So we we would like to populate these from C code by statically declaring them. And we got inspired by libpf's map and map declarations. So instead of passing map pointers here, we pass program pointers, and then the loader will hook this up at runtime. We'll load. Uh, we'll create the map, load all the programs, put all FDs into the right indexes at the map. Um, and if this kind of behavior would be accepted into a loader test suite, then this would kind of signify a contract or an agreement that all projects that aim to implement an ELF loader um, would adhere to these standards. Um, so I probably hear you thinking, why do we have non-BPF loaders in the first place? And this has been discussed over and over. Um, so maybe the first point will not vibe with many people, but um, having a standard test suite would make it easier to bootstrap other loaders in other languages, um, might cause new libraries to, to spring up and maybe some something using a different API or focusing on a smaller subset of, of BPF. Um, this would be made easier by uh, removing the burden of creating a project like this. So basically, they just have to implement ELF parsing, prog load, prog run syscalls, maybe loading some BTF as well. And then they could iterate from there to support more and more of the test suite incrementally. Um, and in our opinion, this might potentially reduce fragmentation in the ecosystem because there is a shared goal. There's a shared target, like these are the behaviors that we're all going to adhere to. And ideally, there would be no deviations whatsoever. And everything that would be supported in the LibPF would also be eventually supported by all other projects that, uh, that want to implement the loader. I think that was it. Um, maybe there might be some questions, maybe not. Um, we'd be glad to hear them. I think the activity in the matrix chat pertains to Lawrence's proposal. So maybe we can answer those now if needed. Sorry, Alexi, go ahead. I was just waiting for anyone to jump in. Uh, I have questions of right. that I was waiting. Yeah, for, go ahead, go ahead. So forward. Well, on my side, uh, I 100% agree with the problem statement. Um, I think the the gray area is how much this Rust Golang can see loaders uh, cause the fragmentation and whether it's a good or bad thing. Uh, I think collectively we can think of many pros and cons to this uh, loader competition at the same time and but obviously it causes the uh, fragmentation and uh, inconsistencies and what is being produced is diverging and this is just looking at linux ecosystem where kernel 
is common and on the other side the LVM common and in between we already have like three different loaders with uh, windows in the picture we have completely different kernel and I don't think they use L4 format uh, for loading so that could be um, yet another problem plus like loading on non uh, general proper CPUs like internet runomnic that's a bit different though it goes through the hardware and through the system call so the surface problem is somewhat different but absolutely I think it's uh, definitely the problem to um, internalize and try to address yeah um, maybe something else to add here there's been um, I think you sent some proposals for creating a BPF based loader um, which is also going to be new code it's not going to be libpf I assume uh, it's going to be something from scratch maybe using uh, another bytecode format that's not elf but having a shared test suite could also help developing that by making sure that um, if, if, the, if a new loader project grows within the kernel tree, that is that going to be compliant with libpf? Uh, or you know, any of the other loaders out there could be you know, historically IP route too as well. Uh, it's been a very huge, uh, it's been, been a very big factor also in the history of BPF. Um, I don't know. I, it could benefit more than than just the existing contenders. Again, I don't see them as competition because they bring in developers from other ecosystems as well. Me personally, I'm not a C programmer. I love working in Go, so that's that's been an, a positive adoption factor for me to start working in BPF because I wouldn't be very comfortable writing user space software in C. Um, so if I prefer doing it in Go, then I mean it's, it's just an, an added force, right? It, it doesn't really. I I agree generally that it, it disperses the development effort a bit, um, and so our efforts might like people might think, yeah, we need, we all need to be focused on the BPF, but I see it more as a multiplicative effort instead of detracting or competing per se. Like maybe. Uh, maybe we need to sort of change our stance on this a little bit over time. I agree. I think the freedom of language choice should be uh, preserved, right? There is no point convincing uh, people who love Rust to, well, not to use it, or love Golang or C++ or any other language for that matter. Uh, also, the thing I forgot to mention is that uh, GCC now almost reaching LVM uh, feature parity in terms of producing the code, but I'm not sure what kind of ELF format they generate and how it, whether it's compatible with uh, LLVM. Also, uh, there are DSL languages like BPF Trace that don't use libpf at all, and yet they load <clears throat> all sorts of stuff. And you've heard uh, the AOT talk that sort of replicates this loading problem again and so yeah you you mentioned that i've been working on this loader program concept so the rough idea it was for signed bpf programs but not only like signed i would say is 50 percent of the goal that's uh, getting the all loaders into some sort of common ground is is another part in a big big part of this effort so that load ideally the loader program would be currently is uh, partially completed so it's a 50 percent there um, and it's currently done by mainly by libpf that generates this loader program that can be used out of rust out of golang potentially with exception that rust is always uh, multi-elf multi-compiled unit and it has additional like linking step at the end um, it's, so there are like all sorts of complication, I think, in terms of um, building an ecosystem that where the loaders are uniform and the languages and choices of the language don't pose this challenge to the users whether their program, if they write in it in C, it would be acceptable, but if they're writing in Rust, it won't be loadable only because loaders, loaders diverge.
Yeah. I don't know what the alternative would be in terms of a, a spec. As it was mentioned multiple times before, like LibyPF is a spec, but it's also growing astronomically and replicating more and more of its behaviors grow. I mean, it, it, it gets just, quite just, tricky. Just like, just like go lang loader, right? So you just yeah. mentioned tail call feature that doesn't exist and i'm sure the rust uh, aya is in some ways a similar like it got the bpf linker before the bpf got its own linker mm -hmm. and now we have a uh, lld patches for lvm lld that also can do the linking uh in a different way the house is definitely how does that work today then? i think the right answer you to this is standardization in s more um, but how to standardize it's always of course a question right so like one way is to say like here's a spec here's a document and another is to write the test so i think test is uh will be more correct and precise uh the conformance test for what is like loadable and what we expect to be loadable is probably the best so what you're describing like all of the slides i completely agree uh, just curious what are your thoughts on the next steps here in which sense like it doesn't yeah, to go from here or... this, yeah like how to build this uh, uh loader tests um in terms of process or in terms of governance because those are also two different things um Initially, we could start out contributing what we have in the Go test suite, like in our test data, um, writing a C program that does basic libpf interactions, just reading an from disk, um, letting libpf perform all transformations that it has to, um, mm -hmm. and starting out there. It's just starting with the basic, um, basic behaviors, as I mentioned, like loading a few programs, uh, that don't contain too complicated features, maybe some static data, um, simple map relocations. Um, it can it can just I see it as more of proposing a framework first and then iterating on this over time. Also, as features are added to the BPF or to the kernel, um, to kind of grow this test suite along with the development of BPF itself. Does that make sense? It does. As, in, as, as an example, let's take the features of BPF two years ago and start there. Like no BTF yet, no core maybe, um, just simple BPF. From there, adding on more and more features. Also, as we agree on uh, what the behavior should be, because the BPF does things a certain way today, and I'm sure we would all like to adhere to that but that's a process right encoding that in a test suite is a process right um, also, it's not going to happen uh, overnight uh yeah and, and there's also the the added um complexity that, that daniel hinted at um is how do you involve every project like aya uh Cilium, libpf itself like everyone would need to collaborate on the mailing lists and vote like this is how we're going to do this feature or not as in, it, it becomes more of a governance matter or how to include and bring several projects together. Um, and yeah, I'm, we're just going to have to figure this out as we go uh, over the months, years to come, I think. Yeah, and don't forget the skeleton adoption that's currently growing. Yeah. Just plain BPF loading is kind of a thing of the past. That's what I wanted to say. That like you, your premise is that like let's test on the loader part, and sure, let's. But like in real applications, like look at the libpf tools in VCC, for example. Like there is pretty much no tool that doesn't do some runtime adjustment, setting of the parameters, and all that stuff. So I would be curious to see how it actually looks like in practice. Because just saying like oh here are like few programs and few static variables and maps, and let's just test if the loader loads them that's a little bit too simplistic i think but we need a starting point and but we need to we have need a to... plan as well yeah of course but the, there you mentioned it's it's not really like okay you say bcc there's programs that do runtime adjustments but it, it's not about 
which adjustments to make. It's about how to apply them, right? That we that we need to encode in this test suite. Now, my point is like you you have some read only variable, like read only from the BPF perspective, right? BPF side mm -hmm. code, but it's not read only from the user space standpoint, right? And you are saying mm -hmm. let's write some like universal user space part that would magically just like set everything up and i don't see how this magically will happen like we we can always say like oh let's cover this specific use case at some more conventions how you specified from inside the bpf so that user space can read that and apply it at runtime in user space or something like that but that gets pretty ridiculous pretty fast so i okay like, so it's it's a good starting point to cover some of the features i don't think we will be able to cover like the entire elf loading uh space with, with this approach i think we would get quite far and I'm also only proposing uh, interactions that can be embedded in the ELF itself. So that, that wouldn't include um, map operations at runtime, for example. It's only the transformations that happen between loading an ELF from disk and inserting it into the kernel. That's where it should stop, in my opinion, how, initially. How, how familiar you are with BPF skeleton, for example? Uh, not at all. But I've used our own. So take, please take a look. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's a major part of any modern VPF application, yeah. pretty much. Uh, so just take a look at that and and think how how we can test that because I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also curious, like, what's the equivalent of the BPF skeleton in Go? Is like especially for the uh, global variables. Actually, I think like for Go it will be a little bit harder because you cannot just well maybe you can, but like you will need to generate like the struct that has the same memory layout as like the uh, kernel side of the VPF program and then let user space have direct memory access to that so that's an interesting like besides the all the testing i think that that's an interesting feature that would be good to have like in every language yeah. uh, I I to point out the uh, comment that john faster mentioned in the chat that uh lots of real applications don't use skeleton and they do adjustment after elf parsing and before the final loading for similar reasons that skeleton users like adjust the global variables before the final load or just like map max entries during the loading process yeah uh, maybe i can so andre if you're curious there's a thing that's similar to skeletons called ppf to go and it's, of course, inspired by your work. And it kind of goes in a similar direction, kind of do code gen to embed an API for making it easier to work with object files, basically. Um, but what I wanted to maybe step back and ask is, uh, because, uh, Alexi, you mentioned that kind of Windows eBPF is probably not going to use ELF. Um, I guess my, my slight tangent is, is it desirable for there to be any BPF binary format that is standard across platforms? Or do we think that, like, I don't know what the answer is, or is that not a goal that we should pursue? I think it's, it's, um, it's a good goal to have in mind, whether it's achievable, that's a big question. At least, like my own each is the the loader program. I was hoping that it will be just like single map and single program so two blobs of bytes that's it and in addition a generated uh golang uh, c and well eventually like rust droppers to interface into the global variables the way that uh, c skeleton is currently doing this to me looked at least like i imagined it to be like platform independent and will cover like multiple languages and we can will be able to test all of them while i actually are... don't see a problem for ebpf for windows to use alpha for bpf object files it's not like those object files are directly loadable into windows right so it can be elf why not and why yeah, not just, another... I, if, that's sorry, maybe if we, what andre was saying is that it wouldn't use clang to emit stuff i'm not sure what the what you were trying again, to say. Again, why not? Like, what, what's wrong with using Clang? So I, I, th I think, like, the, the oh, whole no, BPF no, no, object pass. file uh, pass, like, can stay the same for Windows, right? Like, the only part that will be different and compatible is user space. Like, uh, well, if that's the goal, obviously, I don't know, like, well, what's going to happen. But I don't see any technical problems with that. 
My my question about inventing our own binary format is how much will it look like ELF in the end? Because it's just a container format, right? We would reinvent the wheel and, and what would it gain us? The complexities of what we have to deal with today won't necessarily change. Um, we still need to solve the same problems. It's just in a different container format. So I'm not sure where that will take us in the end. Or And I, don't, yeah, I also don't see why Windows couldn't use ELF or Clang for that matter. Just, for example, why not Clank and why not GCC as well? Why not? Why not let uh, Visual Studio generate this code, right? And also, BPF Trace guys are uh, uh, working on having their own mini compiler that's not OEM that can produce this code. And I think other projects I've heard have been thinking about similar. I don't think we're going to get an answer on Windows's behalf during this session. So maybe uh, that's to be discussed at a later date. One thing I was wondering about, um, like longer time ago, uh, like before you uh, had the BPF loads, BPF uh, proposal, there was also one where we were thinking to use the user mode helper and basically have an have like a binary that would communicate uh, behind the syscall interface and that could potentially be um you know it could potentially also be in a different runtime maybe uh i, I I'm, I'm not sure like how feasible that is i mean it, it doesn't have to be behind the syscall interface of course but it would be nice to have some sort of a drop in where you could then uh, move like the different loader um, standalone binaries in that sense, and then like try to run self-tests with it eventually so that you would iterate through them, at, at, at least through the major ones um, and see if things break or if they don't. Um, I think one problem with that could be like, you would, you would have to implement exactly the same interface as uh, self test use like for the libpf c code right and that might not be practical um and yeah i mean overall i think it would be nice to have like like even rci you know like have different like in the future uh like running the test with lvm like if gcc catches up then also have an iteration with gcc or like a, a different ci is formed with that uh, for all the kernel patches that are coming in, and that would be a dream, right? <laughs> um, to see if things break or not. Um, By the way, on that topic, we have had support for GCC for years now. Like we, uh, the self test BPF make file when it detects that GCC supports BPF target, it actually builds a separate flavor of test frogs for GCC. So yeah, we have like right. test frogs, now ALU32, and then GCC BPF. I don't know if anyone in practice uses it, but like it's there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I mean, question is if anybody tried it out, maybe the GCC folks, but they could probably clarify that. Yeah, sounds like we won't be able to solve it in the last uh, minute, but yeah, like Estima put it really well is the the governance question and practical like approach questions like we need to start solving them uh, whether it's a discussion should continue on mailing list or office hours hallway hall uh, chat let's uh, keep ranking on it by, by the way if someone isn't following the chat uh, someone Alan I don't know he's probably involved in EBPF for Windows he mentioned that they do use Clank and uh, ELF for EBPF programs on Windows so that, that question was resolved, I guess. Perfect. And also, I had a question to you guys like for, for the, the, the Go library, right? Uh, like, have you seen the libpf 1.0, uh, you know, proposal and sort of work, right? Like, even in your examples, you still use some of the section names, for example, that 
will be rejecting eventually. So it would be good for you to like at least follow along with that. And uh, I do agree that we should try to keep as close as possible. I'm a little bit worried about like setting up all those extra committees and agreeing on every single small detail before even doing anything. You know, like it's what we can grind to a halt, like uh, instead of actually making some progress. So like let's be just considerate of that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I've seen the 1.0 a while ago. I think I left some comments on it as well. Uh, you're right, I haven't followed up what, what's happened ultimately. I think in the best case, the thing that Timo uh, described, which is like a separate, not separate, but just some way of identifying these are tests that we should be running or things we should be rejecting, makes it a lot easier for us to follow what LibBF is doing. And I don't, I'm not even getting into saying like, what, what's the governance here? I think that's a bit too, too much really. Um, so maybe it's okay I'm, to just do what LibBF does. I don't So like care. one of the examples in your like black list. Sorry, 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 okay. I have to cut you guys off uh, okay. the layout of time. The next presentation I have to start.